Welcome to the Raw Food Health Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Samantha Salmon, Certified Holistic Health Coach and author of You Can Afford to Be Healthy. And this podcast looks at a holistic approach to health from a multi-generational and multinational perspective of women of color. Thank you so much for supporting the Raw Food Health Empowerment Podcast. We have some great content and events coming up in 2021 that I'm excited to share with you. If you enjoy this podcast and and you enjoy um, the episodes you've been hearing, please share your favorite episodes with 10 of your friends and let them know that this podcast exists. My success is really dependent on you loving it and sharing it with your friends. So in advance, I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It's National Small Business Week this week, and I thought it would be a really fun um, episode to highlight um, how to start a health food store, because this is this is something I think every neighborhood should have. Um, I have a really great one that I love to patronize and I love it so much. It's called Lassen's. They have um, herbal products. They have um, body care, like everything you would buy basically at a grocery store. And they have organic produce. They only sell organic produce. And um, they have ready-made food, which I highly recommend if you're going to start a health food store. People want convenience. So having those options and also having like a coupon book, like a newsletter for people who want time. So you save them time and you save them money by having all these things, right? And um, anyway, yeah, I think it's so great. I think all neighborhoods should have it. And I just want to encourage everyone that if you are young and you're feeling entrepreneurial and energetic, because it takes a lot of energy to start a business (laughs) and to run one, but the startup phase is just it's an immense amount of energy so I know for me in my experience um starting Earth Healing Cafe we were running not only on energy but passion you know and that's that's really why it happened um because I don't think I I don't think at this moment I would have the energy to do that again (laughs) you know but if you are, if you are feeling like, you know, I want to start something, I want to, I want to bring something great to the neighborhood, a health food store is it. And so on the blog, I have outlined all the resources you need. If you're in LA or you're in New York city, how to get started legit, right? Like how to start a business in the County, how to get permits, um, how to start a grocery store, in your area. I I dug into Queens. I dug into LA. Um, And so if you're in these two districts, these two areas, all the information that you should need to get your um, business started legally and get set up uh, is is all there. You say dug into Queens and LA. You mean you dug into LA and New York. And specifically Queens. Queens. Yeah, because you have to, when you're starting um, a, a food business, any kind of food business, you have to check in with the city, with the county, depending on what kind of products you may have to even deal with the state. Like when we were um, in the process of scaling up our juices, um, so when I say scaling up our juices, I mean packaging large amounts of bottles of juice to sell to stores and things we were um, having to deal with the state in order to come up with a, um, I think it's called a HACCP plan, which is basically the whole procedure of how the how the, a bottle of juice gets made from start to finish. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, and then on top of that, there is information on how to you know, set up the herbal side of your business. Cause like with our business, we had herbal products. So if you're going to make and sell your own herbal products, which I highly recommend, or you can just source them and sell them. There's information on the blog about, you know, some resources on how to start thinking about that and going about that. For our discussion today on the podcast, I wanted to, um, 
answer some questions that folks have around starting a business, right? So one of them is the money situation, right? That's like the biggest thing. And um, I don't know, what are your initial thoughts on the money conversation when it comes to starting a business? Well, you know, um, people are going through some very difficult time um, financially, but if, you, if you're in a, a well-knit close family and the family can pull together, I think that's the best investment you could ever have. You have a family that is pretty close because, you know, um, money can break the family. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can pull your, your resources together and start because sometimes when you're just getting started, it's hard to get a good loan from the bank. So if you pull together and still go to the bank and get a little, the, the possibility is there mm -hmm. to, to, yep. start, yeah, to start up the business. Um, as you say about passion, and so, you know, if once you have a passion, you know, things will work out. Yeah, I did not have a ton of money. Um, so what I, I had a partnership and what I brought to the table was investments I had made. So I liquidated my investments and utilized that and also um, uh, my skill set and my credit. <laughs> so I went into major debt, but I was so okay with it because it was for a business. I was putting my debt into an asset with the intention to gain equity out of it. So it made sense. It made a lot of financial sense and um, definitely would do it again because that's how you start as a new business owner. When you don't have equity, you use debt to finance um a business which is your which is an asset because mm -hmm. when you're going into business you don't going to fail so you you'll have to have a positive attitude knowing that you're going to go in and you're going to make money yeah because if you work hard at it you know you're going to make money but you have location is important though you have to make sure you find the, the right location and what you have to do if you belong to a um if you belong to a group or a church or any um, organization, you find out from them what's needed in the area and what area it's needed in. Because one of the worst thing is to open a business in an area where you don't have any customers. Yes, great point. And I don't know um, uh, if folks have watched, I think it's um, Undercover Billionaire or something like that. And the guy went to the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center in his area, and they did the work. They did the research to help him figure out which business idea would be the best for that area based on the needs of the area. And, and you know, they run some, some financial modeling and figure out, you know, which one would be more profitable and all this kinds of stuff. Because, you know, there's so many resources for small businesses. The government wants you to, to succeed because as a business, especially as this kind of business, a brick and mortar business where you're going to be hiring staff and um, bringing in tax revenue for the city and the federal government, you know what I'm saying? You become a business partner to the government. So they want to see you succeed for their own benefit. Right. Um, and so there are resources. Your local SBDC is the place to go for something like that. Now, when it comes to a health food store in particular, you know, I start to get concerned because I'm like, why on Jamaica Avenue do we not have something like this already? There's so many empty shops and there's no health food store. Meanwhile, here in LA, I could na I named my favorite one, but there are others. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There are others, but um, one of the things is, you know, with any business, when you get started, people aren't going to know who you are. So you have to market like crazy. And I find that even if somebody were to set up a health food store on Jamaica Avenue and the modeling might say that, oh, you know, the demand is not there and the need is not there, but I don't know how they would know that because honestly, if you put food in a place that's food insecure, you know, you people will go there, but you don't know that they don't have that option right now. So I'm not sure how 
you would be able to gauge that because that was the conversation before is that there's no healthy foods in black neighborhoods because they don't want that. They want chicken and grits or whatever, but they never put produce. Most black people actually live in food deserts, right? Yeah. So they, a lot of the vegetables even that are available, they don't know what they are. They don't know the fruits and stuff like that because it's not in those neighborhoods. It's not in low income neighborhoods, which because of our history of racism and redlining, you know, don't have, tend to be uh, predominantly black and, and, you know, other people of color, but predominantly black, right? So um, when it comes to putting a health food store on Jamaica Avenue, for example, uh, in Queens, New York, um, you know, my idea would be to just market like crazy. You got to market like hell and let people in Long Island know about it. People in Manhattan and Brooklyn, Park Slope, wherever the, you feel like the mark, you can actually attract people there um, um, to come patronize and then also having options to cater to, you know, customers who gravitate towards you. For example, things like delivery services, you know, maybe that's something you offer um, or you partner with a company that already offers delivery. You know, right. they're, they're Postmates and the DoorDashes and all those yeah. kinds of things. But this, this wraps up into the other point, a question that folks have, do you need a business plan? This would be part of all your business planning. It's like, okay, I plan to do this, right? You check in with the SBDC, see what they say. Um, and that's part of your planning and research as you're trying to figure out how much money you need to get together to start this business and figure out the sources of financing. If it's all gonna come from you, who, who in your family you need to pull from and talk to? What kind of friends or network you need to collaborate with and have a conversation to get the, the funds that, meet, that meets the cost of this business project and planning out the marketing and all of that. Now, I'm a, I would say that you know, some people say you don't need a business plan. I highly recommend you you do Sam. one. Yes. And, 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 and another thing too, Sam, what, what you can encourage people to to um to to come into the business by offering shares in the business. And it don't have to be a lump sum, but you can cut it up into shares and you still have a big portion for yourself, but at least you'll have that initial um, money, mm -hmm. right, to, to start a business. Because it's hard, it's hard, it's very hard today, unless you're a person who has a lot of stash hidden away, but it's very hard today for you to do that on your own. Mm -hmm. So the best way to do it is to do shares because people are smarter nowadays and they know what shares are. You, you can't mess with people's money when they come on to stuff like that. Yeah, and I think um, having checks and balances too, not to say that it's easy. When you're in a partnership situation, you know, it can be difficult, but- I worked in partnership situation before. Really? And it can be scary. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Now I'm learning something new. What business you had a partnership? No, no, I worked in a partnership situation before. So I know what it's like. So what work, does that mean? I work in a business where there was partnership. Oh, okay. What was that, the bakery? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. So it can be very, and it's family. It was family and it was war. So, <laughs> that's what, <laughs> so, that's what it, happens. <laughs> it, it's best that you come to a table you bring the papers to the table and you, you, you know, have papers um, drawn up by your, and everybody's supposed to have an attorney anyhow, because you can get an attorney for a good, you know, decent amount of. I'm going to tell you, uh, we did a partnership agreement and we never paid an attorney, but there's so much information on Google. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that document served us throughout the whole thing it, it it held up with everything there was nothing and then also on top of that this partnership of course was with my husband so we even when it was really difficult and bad it like when I say bad like very difficult um 
it never, the, the agreement still held weight, right? So for anybody who's concerned that you don't have money for a lawyer, Google, <laughs> okay? All a partnership agreement says is, who are the partners? What's their equity in this, in this um, their equity share in this company? What are the roles and responsibilities? And Google actually outlines all the things you need to have in there. Um, but yeah, just have it there. So when stuff comes up, you, this is the document you go back to refer to, you know? Yeah. But when I say need an attorney, but think, I mean, you have to have those paper legally notarized. You don't actually depending. So we didn't, and it worked out fine. Right. Well, it's but you because it was between you and your husband. Right. But when if you outside people coming in buying shares, it's different. Well, that's, that's the thing is like, so for example, if it was my husband and myself and you and daddy, I doubt any of you would be requiring a notary, right? Yeah, good. <laughs> I'm assuming, <laughs> but I guess if it was somebody like my friend, Ariana, who's a lawyer, you know, she might want a notary because we're just, we're friends. And even though we go way back to elementary school, she's an, a lawyer. She might want it legit, you know? <laughs> well, let me tell you something about family though. Anytime you're going into business and you have your family in the business, treat them as a business. Yeah. Okay? Like a business partner. Yeah. <laughs> it's not personal. It's just business. <laughs> because family can be very difficult. Yeah, but that you did. had you had family members working in your business, so it was difficult. Yeah, and the same here, difficult. you know, that's where it's like sometimes the um the lines get blurred, you know. But you do your best because I, I was I was reading a story of you know I told you one of my favorite um, health food stores is Lassen's, right? it's a woman that started lessons and she started the business in her fifties. Right. And, um, her in my fifties, I was thinking of retiring. Yeah. She started the business in her fifties because she had finished raising her kids. And so since they were done, you know, since they were off the house and all this, she, this is something she wanted to do. So she actually got a job in a health food store, learned, asked a lot of questions and decided to open up her own place. And she got help from family members and friends who basically volunteered their time. And <clears throat> the reason I bring that up is because it really takes a village to build a business. And don't, don't get caught up in the ego of, oh, I'm a business owner, entrepreneur, this is mine, right? Because I remember I was in that, but it's never really, um, it's yours as in your responsibility. Your, the business is your responsibility. The staff is your responsibility. Having good relationships with all of the stakeholders, meaning the customers, the city departments, um, your, your vendors that you're spending money with to make sure you can deliver a product. Having all those relationships intact, that's your responsibility. But this, when you create a business, if you are ambitious, right, and you are you know, a like-minded person, you're giving something to the community, right? So when you're yes. dead and gone, this is actually going to become someone else's responsibility with ultimately right. you want everybody to care about the business like you do. And honestly, the employees aren't really going to care about the business like you do, but the goal is for it to be, um, not yours, but the communities, you understand? So you have more people with the same care, concern, and passion as much as, as is possible. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, ultimately, ultimately you're not serving your own needs. You have to serve the needs of the customers, of the employees, of, of all and, these people. <laughs> and the, needs of, the needs of the business. Cause I remember yeah. I've been in the business for so long and I always thought I was self-employed until when I went down to social security and filling out these forms and they asked me who I worked for. I said, I was self-employed and they said, what's the name of the, you know, your company. So I told him, I said, no, you weren't self-employed. You were working for the company. Right. That shocked me. All these years I thought I was working for myself. 
But you're perfectly right. It's not about I am the owner, I am the business. No, you're just a worker trying to build your community. Yeah. Which which makes a lot of sense, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you're 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 giving something um that will hopefully you know last a long time way beyond you right yes. so it's not about you it's about the community and that's the exactly. only way the business is going to succeed you know exactly. so how hard is starting a business <laughs> well you know you know for me it wasn't hard it wasn't hard because it's not like today it's not like doing it today like as you said the, um you know, people have passion. My passion wasn't even about the business. My passion was about what I was doing. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Like, I have a passion for what I was doing. So when I was putting the business together, I just wanted that that thing to go up, the, the, the foundation to go up for the business and get the furniture in and do this, that I can go and do what I have to do. It, to me, I was more excited than anything else. About because, the work. Exactly. But... I already built myself before I had a business. See, that's the difference, you see? Mm -hmm. Already built my clientele. Then I had the business. Now, with um, with like a green grocer and having organic stuff and all that, it's hard to really build a clientele. But what you have to do in order to build, you have to advertise way before you open the business. If you belong to an organization, you belong to a church, give out flyers in the church that you are about to open a business. Mm -hmm. You know, advertise. Because that's one of the things that I used to do. I never used to advertise, but I would buy ads in certain, in my church. Like, you know, I buy ads in their magazines or whatever function they have in. And you might get one and two customers from that. But like a new business owner, yeah, you have to do a lot of footwork. Mm -hmm. You got to go to uh, uh, drop flyers off at people, places or houses and say, we open up a business and the whole thing going to be so-and-so and give a little idea of what the stuff you're bringing in the neighborhood, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of footwork you have to do. And even the people who are coming in the business, have them work also because you cannot leave the work on one person. It has to right. be a teamwork. Yes. It has to be a teamwork. Yeah, when we when we started our business, um, and the place was open, you know, my husband wanted to do a lot by himself in the store, and there was a lot of encouragement and tutelage from myself, uh, you and Daddy, that we need to get employees. We need to get employees, and I understand from his perspective, he just wanted to make sure everything was right like he understood how everything needed to work to properly flow before bringing someone into the situation um but yeah like you know you need to have a team because no one person can really do it you exactly. know? even if it's a one person type of business like you were saying you you know you were a um a cosmetologist you were yeah. doing hair technically you could do that by yourself but in order to have a thriving business, if you want it to be successful, you're going to need to hire people. You're going to need to reach out and build relationships and have class so people know that you exist, you yeah. know, and they come there. Um, so it's, it's, never, you, it's never just like, you know, you're not an island unto yourself. No, and another thing that um, a, a person who's about to open a business, they, to do, they have these seminars and they're free. They can look into things like that. Opening your, your business for the first time. They have seminars all the time. Yes. Between, I think you had said something about flyers in the church. And it made me think about connecting with the Chamber of Commerce in your area. Because that's where the networking opportunities lie. And some other ideas and people for you to brainstorm on how to make your business a huge success. And also, I'm going to link... There was an episode I did with um, uh, Naja in, uh, I feel like she's in Baltimore or DC, um, but she has a restaurant called Land of Kush with her husband and they did um, or do, but you know, now we're in COVID shutdown, um, like a vegan festival. And so because they put it on, they 
that's, you know, I, I, I found that to be like the most um, exciting and interesting ways to market, right? Because you are the head, the face of this festival. So no one can ignore you. Like they know this business exists because this huge festival happens every year that people look forward to. So right. there's an idea. With our store, um, Ertilian Cafe, we did, um, you know, community events. So like if there was a marathon or something like that, we would be there. Some kind of special health and wellness events. We did talks at universities, um, which our customers invited us to. And um, we leveraged social media marketing a lot. And luckily it was good timing because at the time, with a Facebook page, you actually got reach, you know, whoever signed up to follow your Facebook page actually saw all of your posts, but now Facebook has since changed, you know, but I think like for a food, any food business, Instagram is where it's at and having good photographs of the food because we eat first with our eyes, <laughs> right? And first, so, everything. Yes, when it yeah. comes to food, if you have an Instagram page that looks like a food magazine, there's no way people aren't going to come. You know what I'm saying? And with Instagram and social media marketing, you can target people. So like back in the day, you only had the option to like put an ad in the church bulletin or whatever, right? Everybody in the church who is not even interested in what you have to offer are going to see it, right? But you're paying for all of these eyeballs. With social media marketing, you could just strategically um, target folks who are interested in what you have to offer. Now, yeah. one of the mistakes I made early on in my entrepreneurial journey, and it took me a long time to, to fix this um, mentally with myself, is I had this idea of conversion. I thought I could take some meat eater who didn't care about healthy food and turn them into loving raw vegan foods and just loving this whole lifestyle. It is a very hard sell. Like, you know, it's hard. <laughs> um, and you may get one or two, three people, but the amount of time, energy, effort, and work it takes to convert those people, it's so not worth it. Let me yeah. tell you. <laughs> no, just the kind of people that, um, you, uh, you know, people who listen and gravitate more to, um, plant-based food is people who's having very bad skin problems. I wouldn't even go, I wouldn't even go there. I think like, like when you are first starting a business, you want the people who are hot for what you have to offer already. So you're starting a health food store. You are targeting folks who are already shopping at Whole Foods because they're interested in healthy foods. They're interested in stores that sell healthy foods, right? You're not targeting people who shop at wherever else. I don't know what's what's around you or like Target or whatever. Target is too much of a what you don't know who those people are. Right? Okay, but yeah, you go to talk. Oh yes. I for example, you for example, like with you with your business, your hairstylist, you're not gonna target folks who don't even shop at the the beauty store, right? You want to you want to target folks who shop at the the beauty store who who buy um tracks because they're gonna need some place to put the tracks in right <laughs> you know you you do it it seems crazy it's, it's like you're you're selling snow to the Eskimo that's that's how I felt like why would these these people are already into it why would it but because they're into it they will spend the money you understand it's people who already read books that will buy the next book it's people who already eat ice cream, who's going to try another ice cream, right? People who don't eat ice cream, you're not going to convert them to eat an ice cream. You understand? So like if you have, if you start a health food store, you want to target folks who are already shopping at Whole Foods, people yeah. who follow, um, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're trying to sell. So like, um, I don't know, I'm thinking of like maybe some influencers around health and wellness spaces, uh, coaches, maybe some health coaches, people who are really into healthy eating, like that is their thing. Because if they are passionate about it, they are already spending money on it. And that's going to be your core clients, right? right? So like with our business, I really wanted to, and now all this, you know, I wanted to attract folks who need it, 
but the people who need it aren't necessarily the people who are already buying it. Most likely they're not. So you need the people who are already buying it to start buying from you. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. grow that, right? Exactly. And just have trust and faith that God will take care of the people who need it because you're running a business. And in order for a business to work, it has to make money. And then each one tells one, you know? Yeah, because like everybody's on their own journey and your business financially cannot wait for people to wise up. You understand? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So it's that was like one of the hardest things that I had to... <laughs> But, knock um, into would, my head i would encourage someone who is ready to open a business and do that don't go in there too big you can sm start out small with carrying a little of this a little of that a little until you get bigger and bigger till you start to expand but go mm -hmm. in small don't go in too big because i think this is where a lot of people fail sometimes they get yeah. a location where they might have to pay, let's say, $3,000 rent. But instead of getting that location and, and instead of getting that build a uh, store or whatever, they get one for $6,000. And it's not bringing in the, the, that kind of um, money. money. So it's best to start out small and mm -hmm. you grow right in there. And your customers will follow you. See, that's the beauty about it. They will follow you. Yeah, we I'm still in contact with our Earth Healing Cafe customers um, and we closed uh, what December 2016 and it's now 2021. So you when you talk about community, because these are people who really are into it, they want it, you know what I'm saying? And they want it so bad that you who brought it you, you form a bond. It's like, it's beyond a business. It's like a, a mission. It's like a life's purpose. You know what I'm saying? And that really bonds you with, with folks. And um, those are the folks who I'm telling you, they will keep coming back on a daily basis and make sure that they, they, they will support your business, you know, and that's who you want more of. You want as many of those people as possible. I had that type of business. You know, but yes. um, physical uh, work, you know, it comes to a time when you have to just stop, you know what I'm saying? Because your body only can do but so much. But I still have people still asking me, you're still not going to do hair no more? Because <laughs> see, I, was, I was into hair care. Yeah. Just like if you're going to open my business, no, you make sure that you open my healthy business. Don't yeah. sell what key food is already selling, those canned stuff and stuff. People don't want that. But you know, Ma, you were you were preparing me too, like, because I remember when I was working for this. First of all, your salon, Darrell's Hair Boutique, was my first employer. Yes. And um, I remember at one point, I think I was in college at the time, because that was the time I had I was wearing a weave. I wore a weave like, I, how long was I wearing that? You you that you, long. You, you wore a weave only to go to a wedding, Sam. Yeah, but I kept it. I kept it for on for like a month or something because I ended up doing a photo shoot for the university. Yes. And in that time too, I um, I went to a, a an event that you sent me to from Mizani. Now oh, Mizani. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because I got my bag. Mizani is a, a hair care company that caters to uh, black women. And they cater to professionals. So it's a professional product. You need to have a hair license in order to use their stuff. So mommy sent me to this event and I was deep. I mean, I've been, I was involved, you know, but I wasn't really in it because my heart was not really into this make type of and and Mazzani make you up. They will make you up. Yeah, they like will. they do. I wasn't into looks, aesthetics, any of that stuff, you know. <laughs> but now I see I've learned so much since then that if I if I knew then what I know now, you know, you would have um, stick it a little longer. That no, I could I could have grown that business into something else. Because what you're talking about with people asking you, that brings me to the next question people have is when starting a business, how do I pay employees, right? And this is how you ensure continuity, because you have employees and then they have this thing called ESOPs which are employee share 
uh, operating program or something like that. Basically, it's an employee owned um, business, right? You have to, there's like an agreement and some legal structure to it called an ESOP, but it's basically employee owned. So you, you can have continuity of a business and that's especially important for legacy business, like a business like yours, who, who was around for decades, had systems in place, right? And was making money, right? So it, it knew how to make money and keep people working and keep money flowing. The government likes this, right? So now you have, you have employees working, they have the opportunity to buy the business from you and they own it, each person owns it together to keep the business running. So they, it's, it becomes a, a, a source of revenue, not just for the city and the, and the country, but also a source of income for the community because you have jobs, you understand? Jobs, right? right? right. right. Um, <clears throat> and you know, with any business, you want to evolve with the times. Now, when you started your business, you know, uh, pressing curls, you know, um, washing sets, that was it. Now, uh, Chris. Curl. Huh? Jerry Curl. It wasn't Jerry, <laughs> Jerry Curl. But then when I came around, it was pressing girl. <laughs> but then Chris Rock, I think it was Chris Rock, came out with the, um, the uh, good hair thing. And then there was all this stuff around natural hair. And then I experienced in Chicago a salon that was only doing natural hair care. She didn't do press and curl. She didn't do anything but natural hair. Now you're getting more niche and the riches are in the niches, right? <laughs> That's what they say. So, you know, you got to follow the trend, follow what your customers are doing and exactly. you evolve. Cool time, yeah. Move yes. Time. Yeah. So I, I would have a concept for a hair salon now that is around that using the highest quality products, you know, and um, natural styles and things like that. You just evolve and having, having basically a plan for this thing that you created that took so much energy, effort, money to create mm -hmm. and is stable to pass it down, right? To make sure it continues um, as, a, as a benefit for folks who also want to fall into that line of work and build wealth for themselves. Like our, like our, um, our, our patron saint, I don't know if that's what you would call it, Madam CJ Walker, who oh, yeah. walked so all the hairstylists could run, you know? <laughs> she was the first self-made Black woman millionaire, right? If we were to convert her right. money at that time to today's time. Yes. And she did that all through empowering women through her own hair care business. She wasn't selfish. Right. And she wasn't dumb neither. <laughs> she paid attention to that money. She wasn't she was poor. Very, she was a very smart woman. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of like, how do I pay employees? Right. So you have to, you have to, if you, if you decide to start the business with employees, which for a health food store, I mean, it would make sense unless you have family members who can help out in the beginning. You want to well, budget. If, even if you have family, nobody works for nothing. because Family members have, sometimes will. <laughs> not, not in today's time, no. You, they got, because encouragement, threaten labor. You got to give them a little something. You got to yeah. sum up them on the book even if you're doing the minimum wages with them, but you have to do something for them because that's how you encourage them, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to come and help. Um, it's all right if somebody want to drop in for an hour and help you out for an hour, but you wouldn't call that person a staff. But once you have staff working, yes, they have to be paid. Um, yes, and you want to make sure, like, um, <clears throat> I'm going to drop, uh, we used to use... Um, Zen payroll. I don't know if it's called the same thing now, but it's the easiest way to do payroll. This is not an advertisement at all. <laughs> I'm just sharing a helpful resource because since I support um, small business these days, I understand that a lot of them don't have um, the documentation needed in order to take advantage. Like right now, there's been a lot of grants and things coming down for small businesses. And they don't have the basic documentation 
to show in order to receive. So even when they win these lotteries and become finalists, they're not able to actually receive the grant money because they don't have the documentation. So I'm going to, I'm going to help you with this. Managing payroll is super easy with Zen payroll. Okay. You can do it by yourself. If you know how to use a computer, it's very easy. Um, they even have an HR thing. I never use it back when we had the business that didn't exist. Um, I was HR. And so luckily I had a little bit of that experience when I worked, uh, when I was in college, cause I worked in an HR office, but um, the payroll is, is the, is probably the most intricate because you have to pay taxes on behalf of employees. You may have employees that have child support garnishments and things like this. You have to pay Zen payroll makes a lot of that very simple and easy. Um, and also QuickBooks, you need to have your profit and loss statements, your balance sheet, all this stuff in order. You need to have a very seamless way of tracking expenses and income. All of this is important, super important because these reports are gonna show you how healthy your business is and where you need to pivot and what things you need to look deeper into. And then again, like if you have a situation like where grants are coming down to support small business, you need to have these documentations to show. If you end up in a situation where you qualify for uh, a SBA loan, for example, a small business administration loan, um, you're going to need these documents to show, right? Um, <clears throat> and and a lot of and even if you don't qualify for the loans, a lot of times CDFIs or CDCs, community development corporations, they will provide technical assistance to help you get on a healthier track with your business. And they will need these documents in order to help you through that process. So QuickBooks Online is the most affordable and quickest way. Again, this is not an ad. This is just what I used. And before using QuickBooks, I was using a spreadsheet. It was crazy. It was a nightmare. I had to take every receipt <laughs> and put it in. And luckily with QuickBooks Online, it was so seamless. Every time the business card was used, everything got tracked automatically. Well, to say a little about that, Fortunately for me, from the day I had my business to the day it ended, I had an accountant. And the same accountant I had from I started is the same accountant I had when I ended. And I never one day had IRS try to audit, audit me because <laughs> my accountant was right on the money. He was so strict that it, sometimes it's annoying me. Mm -hmm. But you got to do, he was good. He was good at what he was doing. And um, that headache for me to worry about this or that, or, no, I didn't have that headache. So I can focus on what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm saying this to say that people can also have a business manager, somebody to manage your business, take some of the load off you because that business will be booming. Don't look at it and say, okay, I have to go pay. It. Yes, you got to pay. Because if you want something good, you have to pay for it. So if you have a business manager or you have a good accountant, some, it's to ease some of that load off you. Yeah. You know? And I'm going to tell you, now is a good time to start thinking about entrepreneurship if you weren't before. Because with some of the articles coming out about um, employees, employers, uh requiring COVID vaccinations, right? If you feel like you're in a non-risk group and you're not interested in taking a vaccine that has not been um, tested for long-term effects, you know, and you feel like you're putting yourself more at risk by taking it, you have more um, freedom and flexibility as a business owner to be able to live, support yourself and grow wealth without being under you know, the dictatorship of certain rules that you may feel don't necessarily apply to you. So there's a lot of benefits in, in being in this um, situation of, a, of being a, a business owner, besides everything else that we said before, because especially if you in Jamaica, Queens, let me tell you, Jamaica Avenue needs a health food store. <laughs> so oh. we need you. <laughs> it does. It really, it really does. 
It really does. So um, <clears throat> let's see, will starting a business impact your life? I think this will be the final question we answer on this. And um, what if Ma, your business impacted my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think my business has impacted so much people's life that I was yeah. out of number because I've had people leave and open their own business. My own family member opened big business, bigger than mine, when she leave. My sister, when my sister, when she left her business, new image for people who know her. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's an, it's an impact on the community because you're really setting up your community and you're helping people. So yes, it's, it impact people. Yeah. It's a great admiration. When yeah, but it grow. Right. And you're talking about being in a position to give jobs to folks that have a difficult time, like new immigrants, new immigrants, you know, people who have skill sets, but are looked down, you know, exactly. in larger companies and things like that. You're able to give them the opportunity to provide for themselves and their families. Their family, because they need food on their table. They have to eat. They need a roof over their head. Somebody right. got to them yes yeah right and then on top of that i'm just thinking like um <clears throat> your family members right yes. you gave yeah. grandma a job you gave Boy. your your sisters a job your brother a job exactly. everybody had a job <laughs> and, and, and a job and then sean yes was, i had a job <laughs> my, my nephew sean had a job what was he doing at the first shop he was 14 he used to come in and and help keep it tidy and whatever do little things oh around. he had my job <laughs> Everybody that was had, my first job too and it's an encouragement to tell the only person who never worked in the business was chuck but chuck wanted to open a, a chair with him um, doing cutting hair you know barbering but his artwork was in the salon that's true his artwork was there he used to come there, make money doing artwork with T-shirts and stuff. Yeah, I forget about that. Yes, <laughs> make some money. Oh. Yes, yes. It's so the whole family, the whole family has an income source. And <laughs> from grandma, this grandma, business. Used, grandma used to sell accessories while she was at work. She had yeah. a little business in the shop. Yeah. Yes, that. So, it family business is very good because you're helping your family. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you're helping the community. I mean, all your customers talked about how much they just miss sitting in your chair and talking to you because of all of the value you gave them, the, the life coaching, the spiritual coaching, you know, before that term even existed, that's what you did. You just, you know, was there to not only save them um, the time and effort of doing their hair themselves, but also being a, a soundboard for them you know, spiritually, emotionally, <laughs> mentally, and physically. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I remember my girlfriend, daughter, I won't call her name, but you know, she used to say to me, she's a doctor now. She used to say to me, you speak like a doctor. The way you talk, you talk like you're a doctor. And I mean, I never take it as anything, but I used to tell people how they're supposed to take care of themselves, not just their hair, but the, you know, and um, I never it's all connected. It. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, it is. Because you see, if you don't, if you're not, if you're not having the proper nutrition, your hair will not stay in your head. <laughs> It'll fall out. Right. And see, I was into hair care. I wasn't into all these, you know, because I never used to bleach hair. I never used to do high process hair. I never used to try to get rid of the hair we have. I tried to keep that here, you know, take care of here. That's what it was, was hair care. So they used to call me doc. Yeah. You know, so, which is, which is, I'm humbled by it. It helped me to, because that encourages me. It's, it strengthens my labor because I see the hair growing and I was yeah. getting very results, you know? Yeah. You see the impact of your work. Exactly. Yeah. And like, for me, um, <clears throat> I have to start with saying how your business impacted my life because you, like we talked about on the podcast so many times before, you came here as an immigrant 
right? And started this business. And not only were you able to employ your family members, right, who are also immigrants, but you were able to put both your kids through private school their entire life, send them to college, right? And you're talking about building generational wealth. You bought a home, you bought a car, like we always no, had food, cars, cars, you know? So it's like the, the, the impact is just, it's cascade, like it's just never ending. It just flows and flows. And I was able to start building a resume because I got the job from you, you know, which I wouldn't have had many opportunities. I know teenagers back in those times were probably getting summer jobs um, you know, at McDonald's and things like that. I didn't have to do that. I worked at my mom's salon, sweeping the floors, um, folding towels, folding towels, cleaning out the rollers, processing checks, uh, balancing out the, the register at the end of the night and at the end of the week depositing, you know, and, and all of those things, building up these administrative skills so I could start to have a resume. And I have never been looking for a job and not been able to find a job ever since, right? So, you know, whatever schooling, whatever, I've always had work and it started there. And- um, <clears throat> you, And you work in your dad business also. I worked in my dad business also, yeah, yeah. And um, he didn't have to, and, and my dad, of course, you know, you always take a chance when you hire someone new, but he already knew my work ethic because I had already been working for you, you know what I'm saying? So it's like that first person is really taking the risk. They don't know what kind of employee you're gonna be, you know? But right. the next person gets to benefit from at least having an idea on that past experience. So thank you for that. You know, that business just gave and gave and gave. Anytime, sweetheart, I can do it <laughs> all over again, you're welcome. And in, in terms of, of my business, my business, Earth Healing Cafe, was even more of a learning and growing experience than college. Like, I grew emotionally, spiritually, like, <clears throat> I saw what my limits were, <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> I mean, when they, when they talk about um, getting out your comfort zone, whoa, I was, I was, whoa! <laughs> I was out there, like really like, you know, I had to do all the things that um, I was uncomfortable doing. Oh, but then, yes. But yes. then I got comfortable and I yes. learned so much and it made me, I, I would say I'm born and raised in New York, right? But Chicago really, um, what, what was it? It really developed me. Because Chicago, the whole time I was in Chicago, Earth Healing Cafe was running that entire time. And between- but If you're there, you have no one to hold your hand. If you're in New York, then you'd have your mom on the right and your dad on the left. So you were, you and Aki was out here by yourself. Yeah, we were. And, but y'all did come in, you know. Um, but of course you didn't live there. I mean, daddy stayed there for a, a good long period for like a whole year or so. Um, but- you know, just the experience of, of that business really like, there's nothing like it. It's just, it's hard to even com compare. I was a child before that business. And with, at the end of that business, I was a woman. I was a grown woman, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I had been through it, you know? Um, I had been through it. I learned so much. And like, when you have a business, there's always gonna be obstacles. Yes. But you, you really get to love yourself and respect yourself even more because you'll see there is no problem you can't overcome. You exactly. know what I'm saying? And that's, yes. that's really what entre the entrepreneurship journey really shows you is that you are capable. You will have fear. Do it anyway. It's going to work out. It's going to be good. You know, even Correct. when you think you failed, you actually didn't fail. You understand? Yes. Because everything is a, is a lesson. And like you're getting ready to eat your meal, you pray before you eat. Before you open your business or while planning your business, just pray, pray, pray. God will help and see you through. 
He's there for you through everything, through thick and thin. Yeah. Prayer covers everything. 